Hello, welcome to Cure Disease Kuri Channel. My name is Junko Shiozawa, and she is my daughter Kuri. Kuri has a very serious disease called DRPLA. It causes the brain to atrophy. Inherited, no cure, progressing disease. This channel's goal is to find a cure for many diseases. And I want to share Challenger's life. It's great goal. This time, I would like to share with you an interview with a researcher conducted by Cure DRPLA, an organization in which I am also a member. It is very important topic, so please watch it, even if you are not patient family member. Since some of you may be new to this channel, let me give you a brief introduction to Chris's disease, DRPLA. DRPLA is a progressive brain disease that causes involuntary motor and emotional problems and impaired thinking skills. DRPLA is characterized by symptoms that vary depending on the time of onset. In cases such as Curry's, when the onset is under the age of 20, seizures, ataxia, myoclonus, and mental retardation are common. In adults, ataxia, dementia, brain traumas, and personality changes are common. Conversive seizures are less common. It is estimated that there are 1,000 to 2,000 DRPLA patients worldwide. Most of them Japanese. Kuri and my husband, Chiaki, were diagnosed with DRPLA 15 years ago. It was especially hard for us because I had to keep seeing my loved ones suffering as they gradually lost the ability to do many things. And even though we are a family that cares for each other, there are always personality changes. Someone was angry, and there was violence from Chiaki. For 15 years, I have been sending out information trying to find a cure. But at that time, I was told that there was no cure for neurological disease and the information about people researching DRPLA was really limited. I always wanted to have hope even if it was only 0.001%. And Chiaki passed away five years ago hoping only that could you have a cure in time? But things are different now. Medical treatment has definitely improved. A non-profit organization, QRDRPLA, has been established. We now know who is doing research, where, and what kind of research they are doing. The most important thing in order to find a cure is to get information about the disease. We need the cooperation of patient family to find out what kind of disease the RPLA is. That's what they are talking about in this issue. Please watch it. Hi everyone, today we are interviewing Dr. Hector Garcia Moreno who works at UCL and is one of the lead neurologists working on the DRPLA natural history and biomarkers study. Hi Hector. Hello, Cynthia, good morning. 
Can you introduce yourself? What's your background? What do you do? Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me uh, today, this morning. Um, so first of all, my name is uh, Hector Garcia. I'm a neurologist and clinical research fellow, and I work at the Ataxia Center, the London Ataxia Center, in Professor Junji's uh, team. Um, I started working here roughly six years ago, mm -hmm. and since then I've been uh, taking part in different research, uh, clinical research projects, mainly um, natural history studies in different forms of genetic uh, ataxias. Uh, so, for instance, uh, Friedrich's ataxia with the uh, IFAD study, um, different types of spinocerebellar ataxias or SCAS with the USCAS study, SME study, and recently we started working in the RPLA with uh, our DRPLA natural history and um, biomarker study. So, Hector, can you tell us a bit about what the RPLA is? Sure. So the RPLA stands for the Tatorubro Pallido Lucian Atrophy, and it's a type of genetic ataxia. Although we don't call it a scar, it shares um, quite uh, some features with other spinocerebral ataxias. Um, the RPLA is due to a mutation in a gene called atrophin 1, and we know that it's a CAG expansion, which basically means that a certain part of the, of the gene is longer than uh, it should be. Um, and the RPLA is a type of uh, slowly progressive ataxia, a little bit different when it starts in children compared to adults. Normally children, they have the ataxia, epilepsy, myoclonus, and um, some learning uh, disabilities. And when the condition starts in adulthood, normally um, people present with uh, the ataxia, chorea, which means like fidget, uh, fidgety movements, um, also cognitive impairment, and also they can um, display some you know, what we call neuropsychiatric symptoms on depression, anxiety, uh, and so on. So can you tell us a bit more about how the RPLA is managed? Yes, sure. Um, so in the RPLA, as in different types of um, genetic ataxias, uh, we don't have a curative treatment, which means that we can't get rid of the, of the condition. Uh, however, we rely on what we call symptomatic treatment, which means treating the different problems that uh, a person with the condition uh, tells us. So we can uh, normally refer the patient to the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, speech and language therapist, and then we have uh, different drugs to um, treat symptoms like uh, cramps, bladder problems, pain, etc. Perfect. And how would that be important for a future clinical trial? So at the moment there are no clinical trials for the RPLA, but this is what we are all aiming for, right? So why is it important that we are doing this project now, keeping in mind our future goals? Yes. Um, that's a very good question, actually. So, as you said, um, we don't have any treat, uh, treatment now, and the, the, um, the way to, to get uh, new treatments is through clinical trials. Um, to do a clinical trial in a condition, it's very important to have quite a lot of information about that particular condition beforehand. Um, because, for instance, you need to know how the condition naturally evolves, what we call the natural history. Uh, and also in a clinical trial, what is very, very important, it's fundamental, is to choose an outcome measure, something that we can measure to quantify if the new treatment is working or not. And something that uh, is very useful for as outcome measures is what we call biomarkers. Biomarkers are simply characteristics in someone that we can measure. We can use as biomarkers height, weight, or something, or some other biomarkers more complex, like things that we can measure in blood, on other fluids, or even the, the, the MRI, okay? So, so this project, um, one of the main aims is to prepare things for a future clinical trial. So for instance, we are going to follow up the participants to know which signs and symptoms are part of the DRPLA uh, picture and how they evolve over time. And, they, and then we are going to perform different assessments, clinical, 
through different samples that we are collecting, MRI to characterize different biomarkers that we can use in the future as we were talking these outcome measures in a clinical trial. Perfect. So it's a way of collecting information about the condition. And as you mentioned, it involves clinical assessments, but it can also involve collection of biomaterials. And at the end of the day, what all the investigators are trying to do is just describe this condition over time and find things that are measurable. So in the future, in the clinical trial, you can see if a treatment can change the course of the condition, right? Yeah, exactly. And I would like also to point out that these type of studies that we are doing, these uh, natural history or observational studies, they are very, very important. I, I perfectly understand that in, in genetic uh, ataxias we are running against time because obviously people who are affected, um, they need a solution now, right? But, uh, but we need to ac uh, acquire all this information before we can uh, successfully enter a clinical trial. Um, because not having enough information or not having good biomarkers can affect the design of those clinical trials and it could be a reason for, for failure of those studies. Thanks, Hector. Thank you for having us here, Sylvia. My name is Olya and I'm a research assistant working on this project. Um, previously, I studied psychology and then I transitioned to studying and working in clinical neuroscience. And I joined this team about five months ago, so now I'm working with Hector in the Ataxia Center. I'm working on DRPLA research as well as other types of genetic ataxias. So we have been talking a lot about what's this study and what are the objectives, but let's talk about who can actually participate. So we're looking for participants of any age who carry the mutation that causes the RPLA, but also we're looking for participants who don't have the RPLA to act as controls. So this can be a spouse or a family member, and this will allow us to compare how people with the RPLA differ from those without. So we are looking for individuals with the RPLA, but also some of their family members or spouses, even friends. Exactly, yeah. And then it's important that um, these control subjects do not have other types of ataxia. That's right. So for those that are interested in participating, let's talk about how frequent these study visits might be. So it's a two-day consultation that takes place once a year and it continues over the course of three years. And we do cover costs if you are needing to travel into London and if you need to stay the night, then we'll cover the cost of the accommodation as well. Perfect. So it's one visit per year and okay. the total is three visits. That's right. Okay, so in these yearly study visits, what do you do? What do participants have to prepare for? So we carry out several different types of assessments. Um, this will include information about your genetics, your general health and your clinical history, as well as um, physical examinations, uh, functional assessments and tests of your cognitive function. And also we hope to take biosamples, which includes blood, urine, stool, saliva, and MRI. Although we encourage participants to do as much as they can, if there's something that you don't feel comfortable doing, such as the MRI, then we can discuss this on an individual basis. So it's important for people to keep in mind that they should not feel any pressure to do everything and all the study procedures will be explained to them in detail um, the study staff will also answer any questions that you have. So what's the best way for any people that want to participate on the, or they are a bit unsure and they just want to find out more about the study? Definitely. So if you are interested in participating in the study, um, please reach out to us via email and we will set up an initial phone call or a Zoom call to kind of go over all the details of the study and um, answer any questions that you may have or any concerns that you might have about the procedures. 
So now that we understand what the project is about and what the study visits involve, let's go back to something that we discussed earlier on. So how do these procedures that um, are performed at the study visits link with the study objectives and also with the goal of um, informing future clinical trials? So all the clinical assessments that we will carry out will help us to inform the clinical history of the disease, which is to say how it evolves over time. And additionally, the information that we can derive from the biosamples, like the blood and the urine and the MRI, will hopefully give us information about important biomarkers in the RPLA. And these will then hopefully be the basis of future clinical trials where we can use them either as diagnostic tools or um, as a surrogate outcome measure of a clinical trial. Thank you. Thank you very much for three of you. For the families of patients, it is the source of hope to see the faces of those who are doing the research. Please, everyone, even if you don't know anyone with the RPNA, I would appreciate it if you could take a little interest in the RPNA. So, never give up. Tomorrow will be a good day. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>